Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which digs just a little deeper into the minds behind the best of the food books. Now, you must have heard my screams when I found out that Cooking the Books had been shortlisted for Best Podcast in the Fortnum and Mason Awards. And this week, I'm with the judges themselves to discuss the food books also nominated for these Oscars of the food world. Get your shopping list ready for the best books of the year. It's a beautiful book. You feel like you've got insight into her world. And I love the fact that the recipes aren't intimidating, as they as they shouldn't be, because Mediterranean food is sh- very simple. The judges this year are three brilliant food writers, all of whom have been on Cooking the Books themselves and were the pick of the best in 2021. Mark Diacono, whose book Herb was on the shortlist, Georgina Hayden, who won Best Cookery Writer, and Tara Wigley, who, with Sammy Tamimi, won Best Cookery Book. I began by asking Mark what in this busy awards season makes the Fortnum and Mason Award stand out from the crowd. It's a really interesting thing because I think all of the food, the distinctive, you know, food awards that are um, in the UK all have their own identity. And somehow the Fortnum and Mason one has gone from a kind of, you know, fairly uh, recent start to being really kind of very well loved, very well appreciated. And I think one of the things that one of the kind of pressures I felt was that the judging process is really well respected. You know, it's really um, solid. It's very thorough. Everybody, you know, even before I kind of got into this year's uh, kind of thing, you know, it was just, it, I was very aware that it was very well respected and needing to kind of live up to that. Um, and I think that makes it such a, there's something very, comforting and very rewarding about just being shortlisted never mind winning the thing just being shortlisted is a hell of an achievement I mean it's an extraordinary achievement I was shortlisted um for um herb and you know there are there are maybe a few things that I think as a food book writer that make you feel like it wasn't just you in your lonely room tinkering away it one of them is if somebody (laughs) says I've just made you or whatever and it was extraordinary that just makes you go okay that was all just totally worth it um but getting shortlisted and um getting shortlisted for um, the Fortnum and Masons is a, is, a, is a big, big deal. Never mind winning it. Just getting shortlisted is an extraordinary thing. Uh, and it felt very nice. Well, we we do actually have two winners mm. from last year. Georgie Hayden, cookery writer, and Tara mm. uh, Wiggly with Sammy to me before cookery book for Palestine. I mean, what, is it, what did it mean to you, Georgie, to get the Cookery Writer Award last year? Do you know that I... I don't think I'm, I'm someone who's not often lost for words, which I'm sure you'll all uh, be laughing at because you'll know that'd be very true. Um, I was totally <laughs> blown away. Um, like Mark said, just being shortlisted is a really, really big deal, obviously. Um, and to be in amazing company, you know, Diane Henry, Mira Soda, you know, very, very sort of like, wow, that's incredible. Um, and to win, it, it's life changing. For me, it has been life changing. I've been doing this you know, my whole working life, I've been food writing, developing 16, 17 years now. And you chip away, you chip away, like Mark says, you know, um, really putting the effort in and to be highly regarded. You know, Fortnum's Awards are huge. Everyone knows what Fortnum and Mason's is all around the country. It's not like a city centric thing. It's a massively widely loved establishment. And and that is just oh, like such a, the ultimate accolade, isn't it? It's just incredible. Um, and for me, yeah. it has been life changing as well. You know, I, I've been writing my books. I write my columns. You know, lots of people know me from my sort of Mediterranean separate heritage. But the columns I write, I write about all types of food because I've always cooked everything. And I won it for my Waitrose column, which um, was just really humbling because that's something I really loved. I wrote it in lockdown with a tiny, I was pregnant and then a very newborn baby and a toddler. You know, it was a really challenging time for everyone and, and to win it specifically for something that was really quite hard as well. You know, I was very, I was emotional. And then it led to something very life-changing for me. It led to a TV show and the Channel 4 show, The Great Cookbook Challenge, where my my knowledge was considered worthy. As So it's been life-changing on lots of levels for me. Yeah, yeah. Tara, was it life-changing for you? I mean, for, for Sammy and I, it was just such a joy. We put our absolute heart and soul into Palestine for 
sort of two years. So it was it was such a great moment to for it to be recognised. Um, also for me personally, it was amazing validation because my work on Ottolenghi books um, has always been in collaboration previously, and this was the first book with my name on the cover. So uh, you know, after the nerves of actually putting my own voice out there and then getting validation for that was hugely exciting. Um, and also, it was just a great party. I mean, no one had been out for two years, and we were just like kids released in the sweet shop. <laughs> Feral is the word. The sweets were uh, Fortnum and Mason sweets. So so there were lots of very happy people having a great time. So it was a great night and a great prize and just, yeah, completely, completely incredible. Once sort of a dream come true. Mark, let's talk about the best food book. In the past, uh, that's gone to B. Wilson, The Way We Eat in 2020 and James Rebank's English Pastoral 2021. I mean, huge books. These are really important books. This is kind of, you know, the big deal. Um, the first on the shortlist is A Curious Absence of Chickens, a journal of life, food and recipes from Puglia by Sophie Grigson, one of my favourite of the year. Why do you think that this one was on the shortlist? Uh, it, was, it was really interesting because um i i knew sort of back of brain that um sophie had made this move but i didn't know anything else about it when the book came through um i just start i just gave it a quick now i saw it come through i gave it a couple of minutes and then i kind of fell into it and that that was really interesting um it it dragged me in i mean i'm a sucker for food books that are soaked in people and place you know I, I really love to feel like i'm getting a taste of somebody somewhere sometime uh, and and the food and drink of that place, and it really sucked me in. Um, it it's got great recipes, largely kind of unfussy, uncomplicated, but delicious. Um, I love the writing. It had some things that reminded me of of, of Jane Griggs and them other um, books. In that um, th- there's there's you f- I feel like I'm with her. The, her 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 voice is there all the way through. Um, the there's no photography. It's a really straightforward, uh, no messing about book. It's not going to dazzle you with design or anything like that. But I really loved it. The simplicity of it really went with the simplicity of the food. I loved that sense of adventure. I mean, I listened also, um, after I'd read it, I listened to the podcast you did with her. And just that sense of the kids are gone. It's an empty nest. I'm not going to sit around and wait for life to run out. I'm going to go and strangle the living backside out of it. And it was a real sense of, right, I'm off. And, and I just loved it. I, th- I thought all of that sense of adventure and fun was in the book. Uh, the, the recipes are great. I just loved everything about it. I thought it was really a, a lovely book that had got yeah. under the radar somehow. Um, uh, and, and I was really kind of pleased with it. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I, I absolutely. I think it's a big book in terms of that sense of adventure. I mean, I'm totally inspired by it. I may well change my life because of it. I think I may well run after Puglia at some point as well. Um, second, uh, and this is again your choice, um, Mark, is Eating to Extinction. Now, this is a t- totally different book. This is Dan Saladino's The World's Rarest Foods and Why We Need to save them. Um, could have gone in the debut book, actually, because bizarrely, it's his first book. I uh, can't believe that. But it's huge. Why, why do you think it t- deserves to be on the, the short list? I think this is one of those books that um, is is kind of universally admired and respected and loved. It's it's a kind of landmark book, I think. It's, um, it's about the world's rarest foods and why we need to save them, yes, but it, it could have been dry. It could have been hard work. It could have been important and worthy. It could have been all of that stuff. And what it is, is as you say, it's kind of, it's Dan's first book, which is an extraordinary thing. But what he's done is taken his amazing ability to tell a story on the radio and transferred it to the page, which is just not even, doesn't even relate normally with most people. They can do one or the other if they're lucky. Um, But Dan's written a big, important book with such a lightness of touch and such a beautiful thread sewing all the way through. It's organised in such a lovely way that you really feel like you understand and feel uh, the issues, the people involved, all of, all, of the, all of the involved complicatedness, Dan, kind of lays out really nicely through, you know, dozens of foods going through the book that are endangered just by our way of living. But the overall thing, I, I, the thing that I find really striking is that um, it's an optimistic book, even while not ignoring any of the big stuff. I think it's a real achievement to have done that and it and to have written it in the way he has with such lightness and interest and fascination is 
it just makes so much better at his points and, and makes it so much more accessible. I think it's a, a remarkable book. Yeah. yeah. I do too. I mean, it's winning all the awards uh, all over the world as well, actually. And I remember when I first interviewed him, I interviewed him when he was, uh, when he won the, or he didn't even know he'd won, but he was shortlisted for the Jane Grigson Trust Awards for debut book. And uh, he didn't really know, he hadn't really written it by that time, because the whole point is that you get prize winning money to go and actually write this book. And when I interviewed him for Cooking the Books about Eating to Extinction, he said that it had taken him quite a long time to find his voice. And I'm sure that all of you will remember that moment when you first put your fingers on the laptop. It's like, I know what I want to write, but where's my voice? I mean, how hard is that to find? Does anybody remember that moment like he did when... Oh, yeah, that's what I sound like. Georgie? I, I remember that really clearly, actually, because when I first started working in sort of food publishing and, you know, food styling and writing or whatever, historically the food world felt quite elitist to me as someone who is you know, very working class, immigrant family, I sort of felt like I didn't fit in. And I really remember trying hard to have a voice like Nigella and Nigel, who were, you know, the greats, and they write so beautifully and so poetically. And as a 23-year-old Londoner with, with parents who, bless them, you know, don't always get phrases right or sayings right, I, I remember being really confused and finding it very hard. And, you know, at that time blogging was all the rage I mean I'm sure blog's still around but you know blogging was the thing wasn't it and I remember everyone kept saying to me you should write a blog you should write a blog and I just remember failing and being like I can't write and I really remember my moment it was you know it, it was probably a good 10 years later late 20s early 30s being like actually just write how I speak because when you try and it was something very it was a real epiphany for me and I just spent years trying to be something I was not and I think especially when you're someone who talks a lot um it's it's just really hard and actually that moment of being like just you know that's it it was very simple but it took me just a while to get there <laughs> yeah Tara tell me uh about feast your eyes on food and the voice in that one why do you think this one made the the shortlist um I think we all just fell in love with this book. It just felt so relaxing and refreshing to read. It's a really nostalgic, timeless book. It could have been published in the 50s or the 70s. Um, so it's a, it's, it's a visual guide. It's a food encyclopedia of more than a thousand delicious things to eat. Uh, it's written by Laura Gladwin. And uh, it's interesting because we've got all these books and obsessed by food at home and I've got three kids and for all that I've sort of try and get them intrigued and kind of hungry for all the varieties of food it's this book that we keep coming back to just kind of flicking through together and a sort of a tomato is not a tomato you open the page and then there's sort of four five six so seven different varieties and it's it's just a book you can dip in and out of you know it's, it's quite an eccentric book <laughs> it sort of goes from kind of cheese to bread to citrus to to pasta but looks at all the, the different varieties, these beautiful illustrations by Zoe Barker. And uh, I think for all the kind of sort of madness and chaos, this book is just a very calming, lovely, kind of solid I agree. Book. It's something that I go through with my young daughters. And I just, I, I remember when we got all the books in, and, and this is the thing with the list as well. It's very, there's a real variety. All four books are so different. And... That one, again, I, I agree with time. It really stood out for me in a way you think, oh, goodness, it's just so different from Dan's. You know, like, it, it couldn't be more different. Mm. But, but so important. And all the books were, you know, like Georgie's saying, of, of kind of writing being about mm. having the actual confidence to be yourself and not worry that you're not Nigella and Nigel mm. Slater. Mm. And mm. to actually get to the point where you yeah. can be confident enough to write such a kind of... Uh, nostalgic and quite old-fashioned book or Dan you know this sort of madly ambitious sort of 10-year sort of in the writing book to actually have the confidence to have your own voice. It does say a lot for the British publishing scene doesn't it? it there's such an eclectic variety uh, of books out there. I mean it, to me like one of those kind of nerdy books that kids read you know everything you need to know about beans mm. and yeah. eggs and you know you can rattle off facts i can imagine that yeah. that would re go down with a certain kind of child um omelette 
Food, Love, Chaos and Other Conversations yes. by Jessie Ware is also on the shortlist. I mean, you couldn't get more different <laughs> books on the shortlist. Yes. Georgie, <laughs> tell us about this one. I loved Omelette. Um, I, they are so different. The books are so different. And Omelette is just something I think is such an easy read. And I don't, that is, you know, in a way because it's so wonderful. Um, if people are fans of the Table Manners podcast, they'll be familiar with Jessie um, and her love of food. Obviously, she's a singer um but i you know i'm a big fan of table manners i think it's a fantastic podcast and this is you know similar it's got jesse's humor it's a small book it's thin it's not it's not long i had it on my you know bedside table and i you know mind the pun i gobbled it up i just read it very quickly it's a series of short stories and a couple of you know recipe here and there memories anecdotes with jesse's you know she's very witty she's funny you know lots of famous names and people that people be familiar with but not you know I didn't think it was like cringingly name dropper or anything like that and I just loved it I thought it yeah. was such a refreshing change and also um the thing is I think of a lot of food books they can be intimidating and obviously we're all very um into food I don't want to use the word foodie but we are we all love food we all live it and breathe it but I think it's a book that has a mass appeal whether you are obsessed with food like we are or you are just a normal person who likes to eat and your life revolves around the dinner table with your friends and family I think I think it's got a mass appeal yeah absolutely let's go into the debut food book now this is one of those um categories that launches people in the past Olia Hercules uh she won in 2016 for Mamushka now look where she is Gilmella uh for Gather in 2017 Samin Nosrat well she did quite well didn't she <laughs> um Olivia Potts who was my very first episode on on cooking the books with a half-baked idea wonderful stories um George, you're going to start with the shortlist on this one. Fibre for Life, yes. Live Longer and Healthier with Nature's Miracle Ingredient by Dr. Cosro Ezaznik. Yes. Um, tell us tell us about that one, uh, Georgie. I mean, were there so many books on fibre? Yes, there are. But do you know what? Um, so like a lot of people, obviously, I love food and I want to understand um, its impact on my body more. You know, I try. I struggle with a lot of sort of very sciencey, nutritiony food books. Um, I get to the point where I have really good intentions and I start them and by about page 20, 30, I, they never see the light of day again. Um, and I just found with Dr. Cosro's book, I loved it. It was everything from his writing. It didn't feel intimidating. He wrote in a really personal way, um, didn't use too much jargon. I loved, I actually thought the design was really clever. It made it just not scary to read and flick through. Um, I, you know, the colours, I know that sounds very basic, but I think when you're writing about something like fibre, which is can probably be seen as quite a dull subject matter or very sciencey, he made it, you know, f fun without being silly. Um, and I love it. I think it's a great book. I think there's something that we can all take away from it, whether it's lifestyle changes, little snippets. You know, he's clearly very passionate about the impact on fibre on our lives and longevity and how much we need. And I probably realistically took away more from his book than many other books I've tried to read in the past. I have to say, I did read it from cover to cover and I even wrote a book about fibre back in the day. Um, and I still came out with stuff and went out and bought a bag of brown basmati as a result. There you go. So if a, if a book can't deliver yes. like that, I don't know what can. Um, exactly. Tara, completely different. The Female Chef, Stories and Recipes from 31 Redefining the British Food Scene by Claire Finney and Liz Seabrook. Why is this one on the shortlist? You know, I think it's a book that could have seemed quite... Uh, sort of dated almost you know sort of do we need to have a book about kind of female chefs but actually the minute you open it you sort of realize actually that it's a really necessary book still to have and Claire opens with this um so it starts with the the conversation about the difference between a chef and a cook um and sort of what makes a what makes a chef and what makes a cook and is it is it gendered and you start you sort of you, you sort of start with this simple question and actually realise it's it's really complicated and nuanced. And then you've got these 31 women working in the UK food industry now all over and realise that, that even the concept of a female chef is clearly a really complicated, nuanced thing. And there are lots of different ways to, to do it and to be a woman working in food. And there's just such a sense of 
community and collaboration and warrior spirit from these incredible, inspiring women. And again, it's a book you can e- sort of read cover to cover or just dip in and out of. And then with every profile, there's there's a recipe that the the chef cook has given. So it's also a bit of a kind of around the world in kind of 31 dishes. It just feels like a really lovely sort of slice of where we are now, kind of what's happening in the industry. Lots of questions being asked, um, but also lots of optimism and hope from women who, you know, as always are getting things done. Well, exactly. And we I talked to Claire on Cooking the Books and, you know, we talked actually about you, Tara, as an example of um, how Ottolenghi has actually changed so many of the conditions for women in hospitality or in the food industry. Well, particularly with the test kitchen that enables women to be able to work nine to five, for example, and have a family. And you're an example of somebody who, you know, Yotam didn't mm. know what to do with you, did he, at first? <laughs> but, you know, you, you are a perfect writer and, and in interpreter of the Ottolenghi world so there are lots of things to do but yeah. it takes that kind yeah, of vision it does. yeah no, the extent to which Yotam is accommodating is is uh is is extraordinary really you know I'm sort of three weeks into some some other school holiday now and it's sort of it's sort of it's something that would be a complete deal breaker for so many jobs it's just somehow works and I can kind of cook and write and be engaged from home and I popped in yesterday but you know his his flexibility and his trust in in people uh not needing to be kind of seen to be working sort of at that time he sort of knows that that everyone is consuming food and thinking and creating and actually you could have your most creative idea kind of you know sitting at home so um but yeah no it's a complete game changer to have a have a job that is during during working hours. And in fact, I remember before I went to your time, I was cycling up Upper Street, having done a shift at Morrow and it was about 12.30 at night and it was in the snow and I was skidding along on my bike and I was about to get up about four hours later for these kind of 18-month-old twins I had at home. And I just had this complete moment of thinking, what on earth was I thinking that this could kind of, this could kind of work? Or if a kid got sick in a restaurant, you can't just leave a part, you know, you can't leave service because <laughs> uh, it just doesn't work like that. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a complete game changer to have a space where you can be obsessed, as Georgie says, by, by food and writing and eating and cooking, but also have a family. Exactly. There are lots and lots of different dimensions um, to, to talk about in that book. Um, let's go on to the cookery book category. Past winners have been Sarit uh, Packer and Nitamar for Honey & Co. in 2015, Diana Henry's Simple, uh, Sybil Kapoor's lovely book, Sight, Smell, Touch, Taste, Sound, A New Way to Cook, and Fuchsia Dunlop, obviously. Big books. Um, quite sort of, you know, putting, again, putting new ideas out there. Tara, you wanted to talk about Crave, recipes arranged by flavour to suit your mood and appetite by Ed Smith. Yes. Why did this one make it to the shortlist, do you think? As with Ed's previous book on the side, it's just a really clever, smart, new idea, which, again, when you've got 100 more cookbooks sitting on your your ping pong table, you realise how novel it is to have a new idea, which doesn't feel kind of whimsical. Um, So he's a really smart guy who can really write really well, but he's also got a good sense of humour and... and, um, and so yeah, he he the 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 premise of the food is is you don't go home and think oh I want to eat a cauliflower you sort of you think what am I in the mood for what do I want to eat tonight and it and then it comes down to kind of these six different flavour uh, profiles that he's got so it's kind of uh, spicy or tart and sour or rich and savoury or cheesy or fresh and fragrant depending not so much on the season but more the weather because you can have all weathers within different seasons. Um, so for me, it feels like, you know, when you sort of wear the right clothes or the wrong clothes, so you can wear a pair of jeans throughout the week, but the way that you wear them is, is different depending on, on how you feel and whether you're kind of at home in your slippers or you're going out. Um, so that, that kind of analogy just really kind of makes a lot of sense for me when it comes to, comes to food. So it's, it's this clever pegs around which I hang the book. And then once he's got those pegs, he just delivers just really great recipes that feel familiar on one hand, but they've also got a twist too. And they're very recognisable. You know, those six flavour profiles, fresh and fragrant, tart and sour, chilli and heat, spiced and curried, rich and savoury, 
cheesy and creamy. It's like, yeah. oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's and I know exactly what mood. You're absolutely yeah. right. I know exactly what mood I want to be in for for those kind of foods. Uh, yeah, I agree with Tara. I just felt. I've tried to cook from all the cookery books. I think that's really important as well. You know, mm. like we, we read the mm. books, but, you know, do the recipes deliver? And of course they do. And Ed's a really great recipe writer. But, you know, I, it's, it's really rare you get a book. Obviously, there, there'll be cuisines that maybe are haven't been written about as much and we're excited to see new writers and all that stuff. But actually, to see a book that is done differently but isn't a cuisine, like that's really hard, I yeah. think, nowadays, you know, to have that sort of a concept. It's quite different. <sighs> and I was just like, yes, that's exactly it tonight. I want something cheesy tonight, you know, and it's just really clever. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I think it's a really, really lovely book. I think they're all great books. Yeah, yeah, book. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah. up against Med, you know, Claudia Roden. Mark, tell us about, you know, how those two can, can possibly compare. Well, you know what? It's, it's funny, isn't it? Because... Um, as Tara was saying, something, you know, what Ed did with Crave was find a new idea that wasn't wild and crazy, but it was like, why is that's really great. And it's a book that you go back to, get more out of all the time. I, it was a, it's a really wonderful book. At the other end of the scale, really, is, uh, you know, and we've really valued those books, I think, where people have been strong, original, the publishers have backed them, they've done something different. And at the other end of the scale, what you've got is something that feels quite familiar and it's just been done really well. And by familiar, you know what you, you know, just the title. It's Claudia Rowan and it's Med. You know what you're going to get, but it's just been realised absolutely perfectly. Every single thing about this book, I think, is just wonderful. I think um, I loved her voice. I felt like there was a lifetime of experience and of knowledge that had been poured into it. It's been when I say it's beautifully realized I mean everybody else who isn't Claudia Rodin has showed up and that can make such a difference to a book you know the design is beautiful the photography Susan Bell's photography not just the food photography but this again is a book a little bit like um Sophie Grigson's you know the curious absence of chickens where I just felt like I was there while I was reading it while I was looking through it I felt it felt very Mediterranean all of the non-food photography just works with the food photography really well. So you can't get it into a shortlist like this unless everybody involved shows up. And I just felt like it had been beautifully done. The recipes are, for the most part, um, very uncomplicated, delightfully simple. You could say that leaves them at the mercy of the quality of ingredients and stuff, but that's kind of food, isn't it? You know, whether it's yeah. disguised mm -hmm. with another 57 ingredients or whatever. I just thought it, I just thought everything about it had been done perfectly. And this is one of those cases where I think a book in a familiar format that has been done absolutely brilliantly will find itself uh, in the running for an award like this. And I, I just thought it had been done really, really beautifully. I love everything about it, the feel of it, the paper, all the details, they showed up and they did it well. I think you're so right about the photography because Claudia, let's be honest, Queen Claudia, as we should have referred to her, she's just amazing. There's like literally nothing she doesn't know. She's just an oracle, isn't she? And the most incredible human being. Um, she's just so clever and gracious and fascinating. And you're so right, Mark, because it's a beautiful book. You feel like you've got insight into her world. And I love the fact that the recipes aren't intimidating, as they as they shouldn't be, because Mediterranean food is very simple really you know I, I love looking at Claudia's books through time <laughs> like how you know all of them change over the years and it's just it's just a great great book it's just the best version of itself it's gorgeous yeah, yeah. the cooking the books episode on this one is just wonderful I mean I I, I talked to her for an hour I, I couldn't bear to cut it down so it is a, an extra long one um and and she told me when I met her at the uh, Jane Grigson <laughs> and she told me about the next book that she's going to write oh. and I don't tell you what it is just in case that's you know, mean have actually revealed it but I can't believe that at 85 she is I mean it's one yeah. hell of a book if she writes this wow um, I mean, though, you, can't, you can't possibly shortly. She would just be an outright winner. I mean, there's no way. Um, let's go to the last one. Mark, this is your choice again. Mm -hmm. uh, this is Josh Nyland's book, Take One Fish, The New School of Scale to Tail Cooking and Eating. I mean, quite the most beautiful book about fish I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, it, it was interesting because uh, when I when this came through, I was thinking, OK, um, you've got a bit of a deal to do to get shortlisted because the first book you know, Wallop, 
groundbreaker, really different to anything that had come before, I felt, in that kind of field. And it's really tricky, you know, that second album, what do you do? You know, do you bring in the orchestra? Do you strip it back and have nothing going on? You know, what do you do? And I just think he absolutely nailed it again. You know, this new school of scale to tail, cooking and eating, it's asking us to up our game in terms of the quality of the fish that we use and how we use it. It's organised kind of interestingly by... Um, size of fish from kind of smaller to larger which again is it's got something of the sense about it that Ed's does with Crave where you're going yeah of course I'm either looking for something that I can just you know grill for half a minute and get out or, or that I can bake for two years while I run around the block or something you know there's a lot of kind of sense to that um a lot of stuff about buying and storing. It was there was a lot of discussion about this one, there, and and it wasn't just the three of us uh, judges around the table. There were the food and drink judges. There was Angela kind of running Angela the thing. Hartnett. Yeah, Angela. Yeah, and she was you know she was she was very good at um, <laughs> marshalling us uh, into and out of arguments uh, both ways. Uh, <laughs> uh, she was very good at that. I don't know what you mean, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> As she said, I'm going to drop some bombs during this, and she sure did. Um, and it, it was an interesting one because it, there were a number of kind of opinions about it all perfectly valid you know maybe um this is a book that my mum's not going to pick up and want to use and all of those things and that's that's totally great but i think there has to be space for a book like this that's groundbreaking that not everyone will use but that will perhaps be a bit like um nose to tail was it will become shoulders that other books stand on as well and i think it's i think it has that thing that i think is really important and because we had so many books through the ones that kind of got shortlisted for the shortlisting if you see what I mean you know made the kind of bigger cut were ones that occupied their space really well whether they were original whether they were cut in new ground or whether they were something like med that had been done really well or something like this by Josh it occupied its space with confidence and there were other books that sat around the periphery that didn't maybe make that cut where if I felt like maybe the author hadn't been confident enough or the publisher or somebody the whole deal wasn't fully occupying the space and this i think is a book take one fish is a book that absolutely like a car airbag occupies the space that it has absolutely brilliantly and i think it's another smasher Let's really briefly whisk through the debuts now. Um, Angela Clutton won for the Vinegar Cupboard 2020, Callum Franklin for the Pyram in 2021. This is about emerging talent, um, isn't it? Tara baked to perfection delicious gluten-free recipes with a pinch of science by Caterina Camelli. Um, why does this one make it to the shortlist for you? I, I didn't know of uh, Caterina before I came across her book. She's got a really popular blog called the uh called the loopy whisk if you like harold mcgee then this is the book for you this is kind of harold mcgee with recipes to literally die for um so it's she's she's got a phd in uh inorganic chemistry from oxford you know her her nerdy chemistry credentials are are clear but she manages to take her madly deep knowledge and create this uh, accessible, really witty, fun, quite light to read book uh, full of uh, gluten-free recipes. They're not naturally gluten-free. She's not interested in kind of that. This is actual recipes for people who want to recreate all the kind of glutinous texture and gooiness of all the cakes and brownies and tarts that that she's creating um and these are not kind of healthy recipes for for the set they're not being pitched as kind of gluten-free healthy kind of clean eating this is the best of the best um i didn't realize till last night that she'd done the photography and the illustrations as oh, well really i didn't um, know that yeah i was like because I, I wanted to credit the photographer and i, oh, I thought wow. oh, the illustrations have kind of the illustrations are a little bit salt fat acid heat yeah. um like who did those like oh my god she did those as oh well my gosh. um so it's just incredible and i mean we could have a whole we should have a whole podcast <laughs> on this book it's, it's it's for geeks and nerds and people who like brownies yeah yeah she, and she's up against d ritali i mean I georgie baking with fortitude has already won the andre simon award um she's a 
phenomenon de Ritali, isn't yes. she? The, the heft that she brings to her cooking. Do you know what? She really is. I mean, I'm a fan of her, her bakery, Fortitude Bakehouse. Um, and I think this is a really, really, really amazing book. Look, there's loads of baking books in the market. And actually to have two in the debut is quite a big deal, you know, because it is quite a saturated market. But both the books offer something very different. Um, Tara, obviously, Bakes Perfection is a phenomenal achievement it's really clever and i think the reason d's book is in there is because uh, you know for me it's a really unusual baking book i love baking um i love making cakes i actually the trend for lots of buttercream and frostings and icings and stuff is not my vibe d is someone who bakes for flavor her use of herbs and spices and fruits and flavors is so beautiful so subtle and clever i've made you know i've made cakes in the book her apple and tarragon cake is one of my favorites um and she has been around, you know, she's been doing this for years. She's been interested in the sort of um, organic and, uh, use, you know, her use of ingredients. Uh, you know, she's been doing this for over 20 years in London. At least she grew up in Ireland and learned from her mother and her grandmother. Um, and it's just really clever. And actually, I think if you hear the words like fermented or, you know, sourdough, it can be a bit off-putting as someone who has definitely killed a sourdough starter that is apparently unkillable, you know, that might pull you off, put you off. (laughs) I'm always killing mine, honestly, for goodness sake. But um, don't let it put you off because you can do all, so many of the recipes in the book without caring about fermentation because I just don't have the time and, you know, I'm too scatty. Um, and she makes it really accessible and really easy. And I think they're just very beautiful, conscientious recipes that are just timeless, quite frankly, and 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 gorgeous. I love, I love yeah. her bakes, really do. Yeah. Um, so I yeah. think it's a fantastic and very clever book that I haven't seen before. They're both. I mean, they're they're just extraordinary and extraordinarily different. I I, yes. I think they're just. It's remarkable that they should both show up in the same year. It's Agreed. just. You know. Yeah, and she's yeah. kind of political about it. I mean, the way that she talked about it on Cooking the Books, it was just extraordinary. She, you know, she she, she comes from that world, as you said, from Ireland, where it's yeah. real, but it really means something. Yeah. It's more than just baking cakes. Um, Georgie, you, you're going to talk about the Sambal Shop, Mandy Yin's Malaysian cookbook, I mean, which is so beautiful. I mean, it looks like the best present you're ever going to get, doesn't it? Yeah, it's an amazing book. And um, so I I adore Mandy's food. I think she's brilliant. I'm lucky enough to have eaten at her restaurant in North London lots. Um, and this one was really stood out for all of us, I think. I, I, I find, as someone who reads cookbooks for pleasure constantly, um, I often think restaurant cookbooks are a challenge. Um, they're not often the best books out there. You might buy them because you are a fan of the restaurant or the chef, but they're not usually the books that are cooked from the most. And that is obviously because when you go to eat in a restaurant, you're eating there because it's probably food you won't make at home. And often the very, very chefy ones as well, you know, they're probably the less used books on your shelf. However, Sambal Shiok, I think, is one of those books that will not be that book because... Um, Mandy has made Malaysian food um, through the book really accessible. She's um, c- tried hard to make sure the ingredients are ones that, you know, can be found quite easily. Obviously, there'll be some specialty ingredients and that is how it should be. However, she's made, she, I think she writes really well as a restaurateur for the home cook. And that to me is what cookbooks should be about. Of course, there's a time and a place for cookbooks that are you know, are pedestal ones of called the Heston and those kind of books are, are fantastic. But um, Mandy's worked really hard on demystifying Malaysian food, you know, its heritage, the sort of Chinese influence, Indian influence, um, her Malay background, uh, her Malaysian background and her restaurant recipes, but also done recipes that are her own recipes that have just been influenced by her heritage. Um, I've cooked in the book. The recipes I've made are incredible. I'm over the moon with them. And she also does step by step as well. And I think that's also really important when you're cooking a cuisine that might be new to you. So I think it's a really great book, um, a great restaurant book and a great book for a novice as well. Yeah, agreed. On all fronts, I think it's one of those that manages to bridge it, doesn't it, between... Um, come yeah. to the restaurant and do this at home. And I, I think that's that's quite difficult to pull off. Yeah. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, everyone. I can't let you go, of course, without mentioning the podcast category. We're not going to go through the shortlist, but can I just say thank you? Um, Mark, you mentioned how important that just being on the shortlist is. It is validation. Um, can I just ask just generally, when when you come to something like the podcast category, I'm so glad that there are different categories finally between podcast and broadcast because there's no way a podcast can beat a, something like mm. the food programme. But, you know, what what are you looking for, for your audience when you're looking at the podcast? Again, a bit like we've been talking about the books, it's got to confidently fill its space, number one. It's got to kind of, you know, it's got to have an identity and it's got to kind of live up to that. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if this is unusual, but I don't just want that kind of receive wisdom of you shut up and let the guest get on with it. I like to be, to be a conversation. I like to feel like I'm earwigging on two people having a really interesting conversation, which puts an awful lot of onus on the host to uh, be driving the bus enough but not appearing to be driving the bus. It's a, it's a bit like the food programme in that I will show up to the food programme on the radio, doesn't matter what's on. And that's how I feel like with a good podcast, the guest, great, mm. magic, you've got so-and-so on, that's brilliant. But I want the host and the show itself, the podcast to have enough of its own identity that I'm going to rock up anyway. Um, and there are a few that do that, mm. and, and they're the ones, because you feel like um, it's a bit like watching TV before the video was invented, is that you've got to be there when it's on. And that's how I feel about a podcast that I, that I really like. It's the same thing. Yeah. It's so true, actually. Mark, I never thought about it until you've articulated it like that, because it's, it's like the appeal of Desert Island Discs. You know, you have the kind of the continuity of the, the same interview every week, um, which you kind of tune in for, but then, but then knowing that they've got lots of yeah. interesting people. But I'd never really, I hadn't, I hadn't thought about it. Agree, you're very clever, Mark. I hadn't either. I was like, oh, yeah, that's exactly why. Exactly. Yeah, that's it. it, it and, you know what, you want some of that person's life. But also with podcasts, you know, we listen to a lot of podcasts. And uh, I mean, the difference between podcasts where people actually do the research, put in the work, have the kind of setup compared to just... I mean, just guffing on was was quite extraordinary, actually. So, so there was, yeah, there are podcasts and there are podcasts. I now realise, having listened to a lot. Yeah. <laughs> well, going back to what we, where we started, you know, what's an award for? It's to up the game, I think, generally of all the categories, isn't it? Uh, you get better books out of a book award. You get better podcasts out of a, a podcast award. Um, so it is a vast list. There are lots and lots of people who will benefit from this. Georgie, tell us, what did you learn from the process? Do you know what? I learned loads as someone who's been on both sides now of the sort of cookbook writing process. I've been behind the scenes. I've written my own. And it was fascinating when you get almost 200 books turn up at your house, you know, reading through them and, and it, it's, and then talking about it with other people. And we've all come, we all come to the table with our own ideas and our own insight and what's important to one is not the other. It's really, really fascinating to see what people take away. But also what's really fascinating whilst we had lots of differences and uh actually I saw Angela Hartnett yesterday and we were discussing it and having a laugh about how heated she said it was one of the best um uh award judging processes she'd seen because we were all so passionate and we had really done the research actually there were so many common threads and I think that's the really fascinating thing about an award like this like the Fortnum's award about the way it's judged we all came to it with our opinions but there were definitely veins that we all were the same on and they're the books that really shine at the end of the day because you know there's this they've got something special and whilst we might come to it from different angles at, you know we get to the same you know winner and it's just it's really great it's a brilliant process very clever thanks for listening and you can find out who the winners are on may the 12th and you can now read the transcript of cooking the books by clicking on the link to podcasts on jillysmith.com Please get in touch on social media. I'm at Cooking the Books with Jilly Smith on Instagram and at Jilly Smith on Twitter. And you can sign up for my newsletter at jillysmith.com. And I'll see you next week. <laughs>